so yeah, this, this is based off of our industry knowledge. Uh, just working over the last five and a half years, we work with about 1,700 clients um, really all over the world. Um, and so we we're, we're very fortunate to be here with all of you and talking uh, about the guts of your business. So um, I will say, if you hear me say Ecos, feel free to go ahead and drink if you have a drink. So we're not going to bring that up again. But we do, I do work for Ecos. It's an inventory management software system. Um, afterwards, we have some resources. So um, we have someone that's going to bring up a sheet. If you want to sign up, we will give out some of the resources, just some templates that I'll talk about up here for a chart of accounts um, and a few other things. So uh, feel free to put your name, company, and email um, address on there. And Brittany's dropping that off now. So if you want that resource, feel free to uh, ask about it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is mission and vision. Um, this is just, to me, extremely important when you're starting. And for some of you that have already started, it makes total sense. You you've, may have sat down and had that conversation as a, as a brewery team. Um, maybe just the ownership has had some of that conversation. But to me, some of the mission and vision piece is so important because um, we've got to know why the organization exists. We have to know um, what we're doing, what our goal is um, in, in not just creating a brewery, but what is our goal to, to reach um, customers? What is our goal for our staff? What is our goal amongst our staff? And, and what mission are we pushing out there? Uh, same thing with the vision. So the vision, vision piece of how do you accomplish your mission? Um, I know this might sound like, well, this is like a bunch of self-help talk, but the goal being with this is if you don't have a mission and vision, I know the, the last panel was awesome about talking how to, how to hire salespeople. How do you actually tell people who you are and who they need to be for your company? Um, obviously, if you haven't sat down and had that conversation about mission and vision. Um, so I know this is extremely important to your story and your brand. I know brand is really big for you guys. We've seen some incredible just can art and some can work on um, the stories that are already on those cans. Um, that, that's part of this. Um, how are you telling that story? Who's telling that story? Um, have you sat down and had a conversation about that story? I think a really important piece to also think about is, um, and I know they mentioned this as well when weekly calls and all that stuff with sales folks, um, how are you visiting this weekly, monthly uh, with all of your staff? Not just the folks out telling a story, but how is everyone within your brewery sitting down and having a conversation about this is who we are, this is what we're planning to do. As we continue to grow, that's extremely important. Uh, something Ecos is working on right now as we continue to grow as a company. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, we are working towards that as well. well we're going to be doubling staff. We're adding a lot of staff to our team. Um, and so we have to constantly come together. And we do that pretty much every week. I'm at a staff meeting going over what our vision is, what our mission looks like. Um, and so it's ex extremely important. Um, some of the questions that you can ask might be you know, why are you in the craft alcohol business? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why did you choose this? Um, what image of the craft business are you trying to show? So what is your brand going to show? What is your building going to show? Um, what are you as individuals going to show? Um, what level of service will you provide? So some of you might start off just in a tap room. It's great to create that brand, create that story. What does that look like in terms of your mission and vision as a brewery? How do you differ from your other competitors? Obviously that's extremely important. And the last one is, you know, how will you use some of the capital you have and the processes and those things to create that? I know that's not on the screen because I know you'd be reading it, so that's what I'm just reading off to you. This is a needs assessment. Has anybody gone through a needs assessment? Okay, so a needs assessment is something that, this is just a template that we've put up. Um, when, when folks come to us that struggle um, with different processes and they don't really, maybe, maybe they're struggling to get started or they're struggling a few years in, um, we always recommend a needs assessment. These are internal. Um, this is a process is what this looks like here. So um, you can kind of see this is just an uh, introductory meeting to a needs assessment. So we've recognized that someone needs that or they've called us to say this is what happens. Uh, we need this. So um, really a couple of those things that you can probably can't read up there, but three of the things that we'll always hit on is identify the operational procedures that need the most help. So what are some things that need the most help within your brewery? Review your chart of accounts with you. So we'll go through that and see what industry standard looks like versus maybe where you're at. Um, and then also meet the team and understand each role. So the folks that are on your team, do they understand the role? Do they understand the mission and vision? And do they understand why either something needs to change or maybe you just had a, in a rut and you need to move to the next level? Um, that's basic, uh, a basic needs assessment that we would do. And again, if you find somebody that can do that for you, what it should be is it should be very, um, sorry, should be very unbiased. Um, obviously, this is going through some of your pain points. This is talking about areas of struggle. This is talking about resources that you have, resources that you don't have or don't know that you don't have. Um, the goal is that someone from the outside can come in and tell you some of that information because, again, some of the biggest tough, I think some of the tough things you'll see, and some of you might already see this, is those who are constantly doing things, could be in finance, if you're doing all the work, if you're checking your own work, you're going to miss some of those things. So this is great to have someone come from the outside to really help look at that. Um, it could be self-identified, but it's great to have someone come in and help you. This is what we're going to cover today, so just so you're aware, um, kind of the, the breakdown 
We're going to cover the kind of main four business areas that we see as a company that people really need to have within their business to set everything up. Uh, finance, operations, production, and then sales and tap rooms. So we kind of combine those last two, obviously, because they're very sales-based. Um, you're going to hear me say quite a bit here, um, centralized location for your data. Um, so obviously, I'm not, I'm not saying inventory management system always. If that's not something that works for you right now or doesn't fit your business model, understandable. Maybe it's a notebook. Maybe it's a really advanced Excel spreadsheet. Maybe it's Google Sheets. Whatever it works for you. Um, goal being, obviously, you get to some place where you can bring everything together and be able to report on it. And that way, everyone can have, it, have, have eyes into it without pulling up 15, 20 different spreadsheets to get things going. And there needs to be something that's, that's advanced for that. So first, we're going to start with finance. Um, Talk about recommended chart of accounts. Everybody know what a chart of accounts is? Hopefully. Um, maybe that's not your role in the brewery, so totally okay. Um, but who here feels like you kind of have a good handle on a chart of accounts? Who here feels that it's kind of messy and you could use some work with the chart of accounts? Okay, that's fair. Um, really, this is, to us, some of the most important thing in helping a company stay within industry standards is having a chart of accounts. That's why it's one of the big pieces on our needs assessment is running through what that chart of accounts looks like. Um, we do have a, a template for that, so we, that's one of the pieces that will help us kind of what does a sample chart of accounts look like and why would, that, why would you set that up that way. Again, someone should never come in and tell you how to do it. They should work with you on your best pra practice and process on how to incorporate that into your brewery uh, the way that it best fits for you. These are some of the reasons why we see as most important. Obviously, it's a tool for mapping and reporting. Um, it, 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 most, most of you, some of you, uh, will run multiple business lines through one company. Um, so it help, helps to have those chart of accounts kind of broken out the correct way. Um, it also aligns with the industry standards. Um, so as we continue to work with more and more breweries um, and, and really cideries and everyone across the board, what are we seeing industry-wise and, and how can we best help you um, or how can a company best help you with the chart of accounts? Those should be questions that are obviously um, coming up and important. Three areas of focus on a chart of accounts that should always be looked at. Inventory income, cost of goods sold. So the key that of any cost of goods sold that you sit on the balance sheet is not expensed, obviously, until a time of sale. Um, so that's a big, obviously, key to the cost of, goals, uh, cost of goods sold piece on there. Um, it's especially important in commodity-based markets like ours. Um, so keeping track of all those pieces. Um, your inventory value is the tool to help you grow. Obviously, chart of accounts can help you uh, see all that information. A uh, big piece there with inventory. Income, the reason income is an important piece for us to see is it uses wholesale sales and retail sales as a way to kind of review all of your revenue channels. So what are you looking at wholesale versus resale? Um, how are you comparing COGS, labor, um, any other expenses as a percent of your sales as well? That's why income is up here. One other piece that I'll add up here is that it's just really good preparation for POS. Um, so if you're, if you're saving your inventory, the reason inventory of, is an in, in income, if you're saving everything correctly in your chart of accounts and it's all labeled the correct way, when you start to go into a POS system or you integrate other systems, at least you have the labels correct on, on what's been ordered. Um, I've actually talked to some folks here as well who you know, ordered two pallets of stuff incorrectly because the person before saved it to something that had dash 25 pounds and he went by a number and instead of doing the same thing, he ordered two pallets of stuff he didn't need. Well, that has to go back, right? So again, it kind of helps when you're moving into other integrations that these pieces are all aligned. Um, that's something that you, know, you should look at when setting these up. Big piece for the cost of goods sold is just analyze percent labor compared to the uh, percent of direct cost. An inventory management system might always keep track of labor. That might be something you keep track of in an accounting system or something separate, but it should give you the opportunity, again, if you have one centralized location of information, to compare that percent of labor and percent of direct cost through your chart of accounts. Another big piece is also your percent of overhead. So what is the rent, utilities, what does that look like versus the percent of your direct cost as well. Um, one thing that we like to see a lot of, and, and some folks don't track this as often, um, is your loss cogs and also kind of dig into what your inventory adjustments look like. So are you looking at those costs of goods sold on the loss, but also on the inventory adjustments and where are those being examined? How often are they being examined? Um, chart of accounts obviously should help with that. If it's not, this is a place to kind of reassess that. One big thing that you guys all know, this, is, this happens on a daily basis, there's constantly moving pieces, maybe there's moving people, um, and so there's a lot of different things that um, can happen very often, very quickly, that you're not keeping track of. So cleaning it up, having a great industry standard for a cost of goods account will help you with that and help you as things change to, to come back and reassess that. This is um, really just 
every time I'm going to put a picture up every so often, I'm going to just kind of tell a story of folks that we have worked with. I'm not going to use any names, but folks that have maybe just struggled with certain things or have gotten to, from one place to another based off of a needs assessment or cost of um, uh, chart of accounts and those things. So um, there's some folks, and this, this is just a, an example of folks that have come to us with a chart of accounts that was kind of all out of whack. Um, and when they came to us, they skipped the needs assessment, which was totally fine. They just wanted us to look at the chart of accounts. Um, for them, they were going through a growth a really big growth spurt in their company. Uh, they chose not to look at it beforehand, but they kind of were smack dab in the middle of this growth. And so their chart of accounts was a little bit messy. And the big piece for them was they had to come back and fix things. And then once we implemented the new COA, uh, COA they then had obviously had to, to kind of coach the process through for everybody else. So just something we recommend is obviously if you know you're going through a growth piece, you don't have a, a good handle on a chart of accounts right now, it might be a good time to reassess that, go through a needs assessment before you know growth is happening. And that way you can see where you came from, and see what happens next. Um, the big thing is sometimes it's really tough to go through, to go back and do it in the middle of that uh, time frame. Profit and loss by class. Again, some of this is, you know, hits some of you um, <laughs> easily in your, in your roles. Some of you probably like this doesn't, this isn't as, as important to me. Recommended classes. If you're going to write down two of them, these are the two. Production and taproom. That's what we see uh, for profit and loss. Really a must-have. Um, if you're going to look at uh, recommended classes to have your profit and loss, those two for sure. Um, others we see quite often, so these will help you break up that profit and loss a little bit more. Um, and so we recommend having these if you wanted to add those. Just to break up. Again, this is just the ideal setting. M we say must-haves on the production and tap room. Um, big pieces. The others just help you break that out if you want better delineation and some granularity within that report. You can see that at the bottom there. Just talks about um, income, cost of goods sold, gross profit, expenses, and so on. This is just a report, again, hopefully something there where you keep all that centralized data can give you a report that looks similar to this so you can consistently um, judge that against other things, production, wholesale, branded, and so on. Um, this, again, for us, when we saw some of these pieces where people with profit and loss um, growing from a three-barrel system doing about 500 barrels a year um, to a 15-barrel system at 2,500 barrels, um, they chose to wait. Um, and so for them, it was a, uh, very interesting to see how they went back and planned. Uh, they had not really planned for the growth um, and thought about that. It kind of all just happened, which we understand happens, which is exciting for you guys and a good thing. Uh, but the big piece is to get a handle on your numbers so they could see the sales see the gross profit, see the percent of profit for each product that was up there. So for the profit and loss statements, they hadn't really looked at that first. They grew really fast. They had to kind of backtrack and look at what happened, what brand grew the most, what brand didn't, you know, what, what brand didn't help us get there. Um, and through a, a good profit and loss early, they could have told some of that information. Uh, these are K this is a KPI. This actually comes from our system, so just a key performance indicator. If you can read it, I know it's a little bit small, and I apologize. Uh, but this is a cost of goods um, cost of goods sold report, um, and this is just shows you all the information you should be able to pull from one location. If you're putting all your information into something, whether you know again it's going to be tough for a notebook. If you have one centralized location that can pull this information, the good the goal being that you can see these cost of goods sold month over month. So we can see exactly what is, um, what's selling. And if you can read this here, this is showing what packaging it is. So this is the class type here. It's also showing items. So I can see if it's keg versus um, a case of something or a sixtal. And then it goes all the way through gross profit margins, percent of sales, and so on. So I know it's a little bit tough to read. But again, the goal is that you can find mistakes that happen if you have a good cost of goods sold um, key performance indicator. Set something up like this that's comparing pieces for you that you can pull a report on. Again, an inventory management system could help you with that. Maybe some detailed, um, detailed Excel spreadsheets and so on might be able to produce that for you. Um, but maybe not in that detail if you're looking for it. General ledger and transaction report. Um, obviously, general ledger, for, for those of you that don't know, it, just all transactions for a given month. Um, so you can compare those to your um, transaction report. These can be pulled out of your um, accounting systems. Um, the big piece being here, again, this is the financial general ledger report. Sorry not to yell in the mic there. Uh, but this is just showing the cost of goods sold, taproom transfers, beer bulk, beer kegged, um, and giving us all the information we need to, need to know on that, as well as the product batch that's associated. Um, so this will help you compare those pieces to keep everything correct. Um, so asset accounts like cash, you know, your AR, equity, undeposited funds, some of those things. Again, if you're using Zero or QuickBooks, this would help you to have a general ledger report that compares it versus your accounting system. Um, next, we'll talk about operations. So big piece here is what are your current pain points with operations? This is something to think about while you're all here, when you get back with your, with your team. Um, what are things that when you start to grow or as things start to change, you won't be able to keep doing the way you're doing now? 
So if you hear me on that, what are things that you're doing right now that as you change or as you grow, you won't be able to continue doing with maybe the current staff, maybe with um, as growth happens. Obviously, that's going to get, it gets crazy for all of you. We understand that. Maybe you're an army of a few people <laughs> that's trying to do a lot. And what does that look like? And does it mean you have to hire people? What does that look like for your operations? Again, just kind of focusing on some of the processes that it will create for you. Um, is it still an owner brewer? that's being operated, that's operating everything, it's making all the decisions, or is it, as the team grows, are they incorporating other people to help utilize those skills to run things that they need to run, the reason they're hiring those people. A big piece for, for some of this is, you know, is your process streamlined? What does that look like? Is it, is it just one person who's doing everything? Is it one person pulling all the notes and then having a, having a team meeting? Um, is that, is that considered streamlined for you, or is it when multiple pieces like your sales team or your taproom team um, and the taproom manager or production manager, those folks are coming together? Are those processes all streamlined? Because, uh, again, it's the operations of the brewery um, to make sure everything, everyone understands what's going on. Um, so a big piece for there is just making sure everything's streamlined. Um, how much of the process is manual? Again, this is a big piece to question and kind of check yourself on. Um, how much time is the manual process taking you? So again, when I, when I asked the question before, when you start to grow, what are the things you won't be able to continue doing the way you're doing now? Um, whether it be current per processes, current people, again, the big piece being how much, is, how much time is it taking you? Because as you grow, it's just going to multiply that time and continue doing it. Um, you might think you can do it now, and you, you probably could, because I know a lot of you work very hard and work endless hours, and that happens, um, but you shouldn't be doing it that way, um, just for your own sanity and sake. Hopefully there are people that can help you with some of that. Um, how are your processes integrated? Um, so if you have other things that you're using without the, throughout the brewery, are those processes integrated at all? Um, what does that look like for you and your team? So that's not just with a POS or any of that. Sorry, lost my mouse there. Um, what other systems do you have that are integrated? So is it messaging? You guys use Slack? Is there an office suite that you guys use Teams? How's everybody communicating and talking when people are on the road or they're maybe all in the brewery? And what does that look like? Is there a certain task manager of some sort? Do you have an inventory management system? Are you using Trello or Asana? What does that look like to keep track of every process that's happening uh, so everyone understands what's happening with your operations? This is uh, just a quick, quick stop for a story about folks that didn't have a centralized kind of operating system. If you're paying attention to the, this might look like some of your team meetings. I hope it doesn't. Um, but again, it's supposed to make you laugh a little bit, but this is just a, we had a brewery come to us that had about 12 to 15 different spreadsheets. So when they came into a meeting, different people had different spreadsheets and they were trying to get everybody on the same page. And it's just almost impossible. Spent a lot of time pulling up different spreadsheets. If someone didn't make a copy of it, now you're passing that around so everyone kind of look at it at different times. Or God forbid you have a giant whiteboard that people have to continue to write things on. Again, it just takes time. And that's not time that you all have. Um, some of you are laughing. Sorry if I hit a, a sore note there for some people. But um, the goal just being that you have what you need <laughs> and you have those as a centralized spot um, that you can come together. I'm not pointing you out, I promise, over here. Um, but this... <laughs> So you might have a struggle with staff meetings, obviously, for some of those people. These guys were having a big struggle. It was taking forever, so they stopped having as many staff meetings, which then left people kind of in the dark, which obviously hurts. So how can we streamline those processes? And some of it could be one centralized place where they can all log into a computer, see those reports, and then go from there. I wasn't pointing at you, I promise. I'm still not pointing at you. I'll look this way. Um, so this is just a KPI on your operations for... for um, what I was just talking about there. So ingredients, keg shells, packaging. This is literally just says report inventory as of date. Um, one thing to note here, this can really, this, for some of you, this could be pulled from an accounting software. I'm just kind of an inventory as of date, but I'm um, an inventory management system, something that has all that in one location, could, should be able to pull very quickly by location and date. That way you see everything that you have and you can report out on it in a, in a detailed manner to give other people or pull it out so you can see it on the screen that you're working from. Um, so big piece there is it should show your raw materials all the way through packaged goods, um, inventory as of date. Again, can be probably pulled from a, from a zero or from a QuickBooks um, depending upon how you have it set up. This is uh, so kind of the people side of operations. Um, I know, it's an awesome GIF. I don't know where we found this one. But um, if anybody's done this, you should probably submit that because that's pretty impressive. Um, what positions right now, if vacated, would leave you the most vulnerable? So you take a, take a second to think about that. Not your position, hopefully, but what positions, if vacated right now, will leave you most vulnerable? Um, and I know we, we understand there's a turnover. There is turnover. Um, I, I wish it wasn't as high, but sometimes it happens. So what does that look like for all of you? Back to kind of the mission and vision statement. If you're having those weekly, monthly meetings where you're keeping everybody on the same page, um, hopefully that turnover rate is, is lower because people understand their, um, their role within that cog, right, when you're, when you're all working together. And so obviously that's extremely important to understand. 
How does internal communication happen? We talked a little bit about it earlier. Uh, what are the communication boards you guys have? Is it Slack? Is it through text? Do you just have a ton of face-to-face -face meetings where everybody has to meet at the brewery multiple times a day to get all the information? Are you able to pass that along quickly and easily? Because again, that makes the operations run smoothly when people don't have to come back to one base point um, to do their jobs. What info is needed to make a decision? So what systems help you get that information? So obviously if you're pulling from 15, 20 different um, spreadsheets and you're trying to make a decision, what information do you actually need to, to, to make that decision and can you get it? Because um, if someone's searching for it forever, push meetings back, that meeting never happens, whatever it may be, um, how, can that, how can I actually get done? And this one's tough. Um, some people probably don't want to think about this, but what accountability is attached to decision making? So again, if this is just a, um, an owner brewer thing or it's just a top kind of three guys that invested into all that stuff, what does that look like if they're just the ones making the decision? Who's accountable for that? If they're just kind of holding each other accountable or you're holding yourself accountable, um, are you? And so I know it's a tough question to ask. Tougher for me to look at you and say, <laughs> you should do that because uh, no one wants to think about that sometimes. Onboarding. Um, how strong is your process? Who here has a pretty strong onboarding process for hiring new people? Awesome. Who here doesn't have a process? It's fair to raise your hand. That's a, that's, that's, again, it's maybe not something that's been thought of um, all the time, or maybe you're just operating, again, with a small army of a few people, and you're, we're dedicated to this, it's going to happen. But as you grow, something that you have to think about is, what does that look like? We're going to continue to add people. We're going to hopefully grow. Maybe people will change. What does that look like for onboarding? Um, how would you rate your training programs. Now, this is something that we do internally as well. Um, literally, we have this, we have trainings for folks that are new to our company, um, and every time that we go through that training, whether it be a four-week process, whatever it is, they meet once a week, once, twice a week for two weeks, however that is for what position they're in, every time we finish that, we go back and ask them questions about how that training was. Again, some of the only time you'll ever learn is from the folks that are newest to your process. So you can see if they learned a lot, and for the first month, check in again, first three months, whatever that may be, look back and say, what did you learn from your training? Does this help? What have you learned since, <clears throat> what have you learned since then? And so on. Um, developing and updating SOPs, so standard operating procedures I and mean, processes for onboarding. If you don't have anything, start thinking about it. Um, what does that look like for you? Um, and again, where can you go from, if you don't have anything right now, that's okay, uh, but start thinking about it now and how do you actually go somewhere with it. Um, a big piece also is cross-training. Um, so, and again, I'm, we recommend implementing anything, but cross-training, for those of you, you know, some of you might have started this way yourself and then started your own brewery, but you start in packaging and then a couple years later, all of a sudden you become assistant brewer or something happens within the brewery um, and you're called upon to do something else. What does that cross-training look like? Do you have a process for that? Um, it's probably important to think about that because if other breweries are doing that and that's, a, that's important to somebody to be able to move up or move, move you know, laterally throughout your brewery, do you offer that opportunity? Um, if you're not tracking that, then obviously you probably should. Uh, what happens if your brewer leaves? Right? Where is their cross-training to say someone that's been working alongside of him or someone that knows some of the information that person knows, can they step in and fill a, fill a void for a little bit until something gets completely um, taken care of? Talk about production a little more. Um, just an important question to ask about production. Um, does production fuel sales or does sales fuel, fuel production? What does that look like for you? Again, it's an internal question to ask. Um, some of you probably already know that. You know exactly how it works for you. Um, but again, this is for us a good sign of what we see in terms of brewery health and productivity. If you understand some of those questions around which one's fueling which one. Because um, obviously that dictates what you're doing and, and, and how you're operating. Um, with recipes and processes, again, I'm going to tell a story here in a little bit about recipes and processes and show you another KPI that addresses keeping track of that. Um, but are they properly documented? Because it goes back to what I mentioned. If your brewer left tomorrow, who is the keeper of all things? Um, if he's the one or she's the one with everything in her head and, and that's, that's all they go by, what happens when that leaves? Um, again, piece of paper on the tank. Sometimes those just get thrown away. Um, who knows how, that, how that's kept? So again, it's really important to make sure that you keep track of all those things that can be passed on to somebody else. Um, we had, a, again, just another story of someone who didn't have a great hold on inventory, their quantities. Um, they, they knew kind of their average cost on some things, but they had no idea what the total value that they had on hand. So they knew they were keeping inventory, but they didn't know the total value and all that. So they came to us, um, really didn't handle forecasting on inventory well. And so the goal was that we were able to help implement some forecasting. So when they put some things in, there were some reorder points, different things that gave them all that information on inventory, quantities, average costs, and so on, but then also gave them tracking 
some monitoring, and they were also able to see forecasting. So again, however you're keeping that centralized data, does it give you the flexibility, does it give you the opportunity to then see those numbers in action? Because again, once they got a good hold on that inventory, they were able to then move forward. They grew as a brewery, they were able to add a second location. Some of those things happened because they could see all those different numbers um, and see where they needed to be projected later on. Again, this is the KPI I was talking about here. So this is a just batch recipe estimated cost. So you can see products, recipe versions, and unit of measure. So again, we have zero estimated costs up here, but if they were all free, that'd be awesome. But um, this is just showing a, a basic standard report that could come out of a system that should show you some of that batch recipe information. Um, so again, this, this will also give you information on seasonals or special releases, right? If you can see what these cost you, you should be able to compare some numbers and say, it's really great to do seasonals. It's really great to do the, the double and triple hop stuff that everybody loves, but how much of your flagship do you actually have to do to be able to make that happen? Are you making money, losing money? What does that look like? Um, you should have a report that can tell you some of those things because, again, it might be an awesome season for some you know, different seasons that you do, but if that actually didn't make you any money... I mean, some of you know that you're going into a batch and you're going to you know, lose your hat on it. That's, that, you, you might choose to do that, and that's okay. Um, but, again, you want to be able to see those inf that information. This is the story I was going to tell you on the, kind of the recipes. I um, had a brewery that came to us, and he had about 60 different products over the last four or five years. And the first question we asked him on the call was, well, where are those recipes stored? And he laughed, and the two other people on the call laughed, and they said, we told you, Jim. And he, he just said, I know, they're in my head. And he had never written them down. So four or five years, right, he's the one person who's been brewing. He was the owner, the founder. That's totally fine. But the other two people have been asking, well, what happens when, right, that's not in your head anymore? What do we do to help pass it on? So, again, I know it's funny, and some of you are probably in that boat, again, not calling anybody out on that, but it's just understanding where can you put that information that everyone can see. Again, I know that's probably very important to your brewery, your standalone brewery for that, those, inform those re recipes, but what processes are really, really hinging on those recipes, um, ingredients, and so on. Um, this is just KPI that shows, again, I know it's really small, so I apologize. This is just showing general information on batches. So showing the batch numbers, products, and recipes. What does that look like? Do you have a place that can pull all that information? You can compare all of your IPAs. You can compare all your saisons, all of that um, by date, by planned start dates, when they were completed, so you can see how many have brewed over the last six months. Um, what does that look like? Again, Inventory management systems are probably the best to, to give you this information, unless you built out a really crazy Excel spreadsheet that can give you that information. But can you get that at a glance, and can you get it quickly? Uh, it might be important to say, hey, we haven't brewed this in a while. Maybe we need to do that. So production, I'm going to talk about safety and, and, and maintenance. I know many of you probably already know this is extremely important. There are people that can, that can greatly help you with this. This might be great to call on a third party to come in and talk about maintenance. Maybe there's a local brewer that does this very, very well. Um, but just kind of talking about a safety committee, do you have someone that's employed that can, can manage this, that, are, that is kind of watching out for this? Um, you guys um, have a kind of a, a blessing up here. Uh, so most of you probably know about it, but worksafebc.com. Again, that's just something that when, when I was doing some conversations and looking up research on some of our breweries up here, um, they have everything for you. There's resources, there's printouts, there's books, there's different things on safety and maintenance that you can do. Um, talks about quarterly walkthroughs and maintenance schedules. Um, some of the things that, you know, WorkSafe BC talked about, top three injuries and hazards that happen in breweries are overexertion, carbon dioxide exposure, and physical hazards. So if you didn't know that, now you know. Uh, but that's on their website, so there's all kinds of fun stuff for that to look up. Um, and if you think about maintenance, the reason we bring up maintenance we see folks in a lot of breweries that we work with, you know, they're, they're maybe leasing kegs or they're paying off kegs over a certain period of time or they've, they've kind of, um, they need to maintain those, right? Because if, if you're going to resell them in a few years, you're trying to sell them to a brewery as you grow or you want more and more years out of them, you need to take care of them. So are there logs that you can keep? Is there some sort of centralized system that you're keeping track of all of your maintenance? Um, what does that look like? Because it also will lead in some safety concerns. If there's problems or maintenance is not kept up on kegs or on, on your tanks and they're leaking, what happens around the brewery can get kind of messy pretty quickly. Um, what does that look like for you? So kind of think about some of those things in terms of um, is there, are there walkthroughs that are going on? What do the maintenance schedules look like? And can you report on those schedules, right? I don't know if someone's coming to check your breweries on a regular basis. Maybe the owner is, and you're not the person that, that's doing the checking, but they're coming in to check on you to check on quality control and, and some of those things. Um, can you report out on that? We talk about some of the quality control pieces again. Um, things that you should be able to have if lot tracking makes sense for you. Um, Something you can employ. Uh, I know some of you look at the pictures, and I'm, I'm glad you're laughing. But um, 
you think about some of the lot tracking things that you can do in a system, and those of you who don't lot track, again, that's something that um, you might move into eventually. And we always recommend start small with the lot tracking. Don't try to implement it for the whole system and track every piece that you're bringing in. Uh, but any good system should be able to give you the lot tracking capabilities to be able to see what happens um, so you don't get to this point um, where something gets out in the market, you've had, you know, maybe a yeast strand got into the wrong batch or was, was bad in the first place, and now you've run it through the whole brewery in a couple of different batches. You don't know where that started from, so you have to essentially waste everything. We've seen it happen. It's really, it's, it's sad. Um, you lose a lot of money, and I know that you guys can't afford to just shut down a brewery for a couple of days to clean up all tanks and make sure all that's gone. So, well, a good plan is to obviously set up lot tracking, understand where things go. If something were to get in the market that's bad, how do we go out and find that? Is there a report to pull that has that information that we can quickly go find out where it hit in the market so we can destroy it um, or, again, um, get rid of it. Sensory panel. This is kind of an interesting one that we see a lot of folks do very, very well. Some don't do it at all. It's just kind of them tasting it as they're going through, which is fine because um, some of you have those palates and some of you understand exactly what you're doing at a high level. Um, but what we also see is just a cool way to incorporate other people. And what I mean by other people, when you bring your sales and marketing team in, you bring your tapper managers into a sensory panel where they can try what's going on. They can see it. They can also hear the story behind the label. So what are the brewers doing? Why do they name it that, that name? Why, did, why does it taste the way it tastes? Some of those folks, you're relying on them just going out to tell a story that maybe they don't know the full thing behind. And I've asked it many times at our booth. I actually love to hear. I love the cans. I love what people are doing. But why? Why is that the name for that? Why is that the name for your brewery? A lot of you had great stories. Again, it goes back to your mission and your vision, right? Why did you come up with that name? It means something to you. The beers mean something to you. Even if it's just sitting around getting drunk on other beers, naming other beers, that still means something to you. It's something you'll, you'll reminisce on. So do they know how to talk about that? Maybe take it a step further, those of you that work with distributors. I know this might be a, eh, we're never going to do this type of thing, but bring the distributors in for kind of a, a sensory panel that's outside of that. So they get to talk to the production folks, talk to the head brewer, and find a little more information about why they're brewing that beer. You want to talk about a brand ambassador. You want to talk about a, a, a brand, creating a brand. Some of you rely on your own teams to do that, which is great. But who can we employ outside of it if you can't afford a brand ambassador, right? Sometimes it can be expensive. You don't need an extra person to go do that. Get the distributors talking positively about it. Get some of your accounts that are your top accounts coming in to try things before it happens. Right? It's just a thought to move beyond that for sensory panels. We see some folks do this really, really well. Um, and again, you have better relationship with the distributor, better relationship with accounts. Your, your, your staff knows more about the story. Um, you can see a lot of a benefit from that. Sales. I know the folks before us, if you sat through that panel, was all about how to hire sales folks and kind of some of those pieces. But if you don't have a plan, if you don't have goals that are weekly or quarterly or annually, I'm a sales guy. Um, it's something that we have in terms of an internal CRM to track things as well so we can compare our own numbers. Um, hopefully, you're getting sales folks who are self-motivated enough to be able to see those numbers and look at those numbers and care about it. But there do need to be, I mean, really concrete plans set up that have goals um, that they can compare themselves weekly, quarterly, and so on. And do you have something to report on? If it's just, here's your invoices from last month, here's your invoices from this month, go tell me, like, right, that, that doesn't really help in a one-on-one. -on -one. Is there something that actually gives them, here's your top accounts, here's what they've sold, here's what you've grown them to, here's what they've lost, here's the last time you called on this person. What are those numbers and what report can be pulled to show that? Um, a brand ambassador, I know this is tough because, again, it it's, could be an extra expense, um, but who's doing that for you? Again, we just gave you an option before. Maybe the distributors could be that brand ambassador for you if you have a great relationship with them. Um, what does that look like to build rapport with the end user, to get that shelf space, get those taps once you get to that point? Again, if you're not to the distributor point, think about it now. What does that look like to have someone positively talking about your brand? Easy way to do some of that is through distributor relationships, but also um, some social media things, right? We do it um, as, as a company, and we see some folks do it very, very well. When I comment on a brewery's post and I love the beer and that I see, I'm like, oh, you know, this is awesome, or I tag a buddy who I know would like the beer, they comment back. Come on in for this, right? Those are brand building pieces where now I really want to go in and I'm going to take that buddy with me because they actually want to see us in the brewery. Those are small things that you can do to just build that brand and just a better, um, kind of better market presence. Um, without maybe spending a ton of money on it. Distributor relationships, obviously extremely important. Do you know lead times that, they, that they're looking for things? Can you get better lead times? Uh, we've seen breweries who have, you know, a ton of, they have 20 plus different distributors, but they also can get some of them to give them three month lead times. Think about that if you had three month lead times on, on, distri on distribution, you're making that product to sell ahead of time. Again, it's, it's invaluable to some of you uh, to make that happen. So can you work on that relationship with them? 
Uh, this is just a customer invoice dollars by month. So we talk about sales. Is there opportunities to show them? Here's your companies that, that for the salesperson. Um, here's the months. We haven't seen anybody buy anything for three months from that one account. Why did that happen? What's going on? It used to be a top account for us. Can you also compare it month over month, year over year to see they did a bunch last year during this time. Maybe it's time to hit them up for our seasonals because they're coming back out with something. Um, are the sales dropping month over month? What are the last orders? Any trends that you see as well? So maybe they are doing quite a bit of work for a couple months and they do very little work for a month and they do, you might be able to kind of call attention to some of those trends. Um, this is, this is just a, a story about a, a seasonal. We talk about some of our breweries uh, that, that do seasonals, and I know my, many of you do. Um, but right now, being the time that it is, um, in the States, we have pumpkin beers everywhere. And they, people, any pumpkin latte, if you can add something else to it, they make it special. I know some people stick their tongue out. It, it, pumpkin's not your thing. Totally understand that. But we had folks that, you know, for two or three years, right, 2016, 17, their sales were gangbusters. They just couldn't stop selling it. And they're like, this is awesome. Well, whatever they did in 2018, the sales kind of just kind of petered out and it didn't really work. So thankfully, they had a system that gave them the opportunity to go back and look at 2016, 2017, those accounts that did buy then, accounts that didn't buy now. And they could also, they did a little market research, they were able to take and say, oh, well, now there's three or four different pumpkin beers that came in the same market, right? And they can go to those accounts and say, well, they didn't buy ours because they bought a shelf space full of this, right? So you can do that information. Hopefully 2019 will be better for, for them now. Uh, but the goal being, can you track those processes, track those recipes, what changed for you or what changed in the market that dictated those maybe losses for that product? Again, extremely important to see that. Again, this is a report that could help you show those, that, that, those numbers. This is actually pulled by packaging type for a customer. So you can see that's angry oils there at the top and then it shows all the packaging types that we have available for them and then what they've bought in volume or by quantity of whatever that product is. So do you have something that can give you that information to say, well, last year they bought you know, eight kegs of this over a certain period of time. They've only bought two. What happened? Maybe we need to ask them. Maybe we offer some sort of special, whatever it may be, to get some things back in those accounts. This is also going to show um, the barrel sold by month by product. So again, if we just, just a different way to see reports. These are all KPIs there. Again, they're coming out of our system. So this is what our inventory management system is pulling. Um, say again, I'm not, you can drink if you want. Um, uh, but it's showing volume, it's showing volume by product type. Um, and so this is just giving you those information on, on, on what's projected versus what's actual, right? So if you run reports that, that this is what we're hoping to do during you know, the, those holiday months, um, what are we actually able to compare them to? You should be able to have something that compares that. Sales in the tap room. Um, so this is obviously huge for growth goals, for margins. Um, is there a streamlined process for sales in the tap room? Does anybody feel like they're kind of just out of whack with the tap room? That happens, right? As things start to grow, maybe things get a little crazy. And maybe you're really focused on the tap room first. And instead of distribution, you're really focusing all your energy on tap room to build that brand, which is, we see that quite a bit, totally understandable. Um, what is consistency, and the last one, just consistency between locations, if you have multiple? If you have multiple tap rooms, what happens? Are some people telling a different story here than here? That that's, can be detrimental, right? If someone goes in and is talking about the wrong thing, or they didn't know that's not how that beer is made, but someone else does, what does that look like? Um, big thing for, for each one of these, the growth goals, obviously understanding those, so you can compare it, maybe year one to year three. You can show those comparison numbers. Um, know what's, what's been working and what hasn't in terms of some of these sales in the tap room. Um, profits and margins, right? You should be able to see those profits and margins. They're, they're higher in your tap room. Most of you know that. Um, so what energy are we putting into continually growing those to making sure that that's happening and continually grow? Um, when is it time to expand our current space? If you're running these numbers and you're seeing margins, your processes are working well, you have the right staff in place, when can you jump to a second location or when do you have to jump to a second location? Because the head count, everything else is just maxed out in a certain location. And maybe, I mean, probably not losing as much business, but maybe people are going to find another place to go um, if, if, that's not, if they're not paid attention to it, some of those places. Some of you do a great job with this stuff, with trivia nights and local bands and all those things, and that's the fun part, where you can drive all that, that, that traction to, to your tap room. Um, and again, we've, we've seen it all over the place. This tap room is where the, the fun can be, um, and a lot of people are going there versus you know, local bars. Um, not to call yours the bar, uh, but this is an opportunity to see that. Big piece for this, too, is those of you that are big enough or get to that point with tap room managers and tap room teams, um, what do those meetings look like? 
what role is that playing in your in your uh, in the brew house? And do they get together on, on regular meetings? Are they getting get together to talk about that mission and vision? Right now, the tap room is still attached to the brewery. It still should be a piece of it, right? They should all be inc- included in company meetings and all that. But what does it look like to have their own standalone meetings to talk about how they better the tap room? Maybe how they, you know, make different signage. What are they selling? What do those profits look like on on all of that? Right? If you're constantly talking about that. You might not, I come from a distributor background, you might not see so many people pouring extra drinks for their buddies or half pours for someone and not charging. Different things like that, not saying that happens a lot, uh, but it might happen a lot and you wonder where those dollars went. Um, that might be something to check on if they understand really the mission and vision on where you're trying to go. Right? Hey guys, in three years we would love to move to a second tap room. This is how we're going to get there. Here's your role in that, in that story. Um, how can we make you more a part of that story? Uh, we've seen some folks that started as a label maker, right? They're just a bar back and they start making the labels and now they're running the tap room. They're still making the art for the labels because that's part of the, who they are, uh, but they have a big story to tell, right? They, have, they also have pride in the work that they're doing because they were very much a part of making that happen. So this is just uh, talking about some of the like starting focus strictly on tap room versus distribution and self-distribution. So we have some folks that kind of early on overcommit to distribution. They overcommit to self-distribution. They're buying vans. They're buying all the other stuff, thinking they have a couple good brands that are really kicking it, and which is great. Um, but if you don't focus on kind of building that brand around tap room, first and foremost, it can kind of save you some money. Focus on a tap room without buying all that um, to, to go out in the market. And we do see some people struggle off right off the bat who put too much money out in the market and then sometimes have to pull back, um, or they're not able to give the product. So once you've given the product to the grocery stores and once you've given the product to, to your accounts and they really, really are demanding it, if you can't keep up the demand, what do you do? Sadly, you have to sometimes step back, which then you don't really want to do. That loses that, that value to those folks. So again, just thinking ahead, how do we start small, grow into that, and be able to offer value to those customers and the distributors who, who work with us. Um, this is a KPI that we see for, again, just some KPIs we see for tap rooms, um, tap room tra- transfers. So how much is being moved over? How much maybe seasonal versus regular or your, your, your core brands? Um, plans for budgets and labor, right? If you have to pull more people in for canning, pull more people in for seasonals, does it make sense to continue to do those seasonals? Are there ways to cut, not cut corners, but uh, cut down on processes by creating an SOP uh, that makes more sense? Uh, what kind of labor versus income analysis are you doing? What income versus headcount are you doing? Do you see more and more people coming in certain months than, than others? Are you having bands in in the wrong months when people no one comes in because there's other stuff going on? What does that look like and are you doing that information? Same thing with merch. Um, merch is awesome. I know we love the hats. <laughs> um, everybody loves the merch. That, that's something that creates your brand, helps move that brand for you. But are you spending a ton of money on stuff that people don't want? Are you getting all those brands, all those sizes? What does that look like? Again, just something to think about. Many of you probably, we know this, I get this. Some folks don't think about it until it's a, a problem or you have 50 XL shirts sitting there and no one comes in to buy that shirt. Um, what does that look like and, and, and how are you moving those things through? Um, this is, a, again, just a, something you're tracking. Maybe you could track um, in a system um, that, that pulls all together. What's the average order value? Um, what's the head count coming in? Is someone, if they're staying longer because there's a band or it's trivia night, are they buying merch as well? Are they buying another flight? Are they, what does that look like? Um, do you offer other things outside of that? You know, are you selling someone else's cider or someone else's wine? Is that helping build business? Because it might be something you need to do more of um, to build a brand and get people in there. Um, off-premise products. So somebody that have a refrigerator so you can buy four packs to go. You can buy a couple cans, a couple bottles. Whatever that may be, what does that look like? Um, and are you doing that? It might be an opportunity to, instead of going out in the market, give something for someone to go home with. Obviously, it's extending that brand a little bit more. Other key performance things that we see and key questions. Um, does your production team... And does the production um, process get income credit for the sales to the tap room? So are you tracking that? Is that something you want to track? Um, are you calculating your production cogs in the tap room? So within the margins, um, are these being tracked um, within the system? Do you have a system to track that? Where is there shrinkage? Where is stuff disappearing? Is it with the merch? Is it with certain products? Is it with certain pores, certain people? Um, what does that look like? And are you tracking it? Let me go back to that. Got it? You're good? Uh, Checks and balances. So again, this is just extremely important. You should always have checks and balances, and this is something that everyone should talk about together. Uh, It shouldn't be just one department talking about checks and balances, but uh, what does it look like to have inventory checks? 
What does it look like to have inventory thresholds, reorder points on all your items? Um, again, these are set up for staff success. It's not to call people out unless you need to, uh, but this is, again, a goal is to have everything brought together so everyone knows what's going on amongst departments so you don't have siloed pieces within one brewery and wonder why things aren't operating smoothly. Um, it's an inventory-based business. You need to be able to see differences, discrepancies, things that are happening. If there's a reorder point that you missed or something didn't happen um, correctly and the wrong person ordered it because they weren't in that meeting, Who's taking that? Where's that accountability come through again? Um, this all affects financials, obviously, and decision-making. It's extremely important to see that. A big thing for thresholds that we see, um, what are you comfortable with? So if you're, if you're comfortable getting down to 50 gallons of something or 50 barrels of, of something or 10 keg shells, uh, whatever that looks like to you, are you setting those thresholds? Does everyone know, hey, when we drop below this certain level, we need to order something else. We need to get more in. Um, what are you comfortable with? Is there one person in charge of, uh, of telling people what their spending looks like? So when we talk about some of the expense policies, um, I skipped procurement there, but procurement receiving, it's generally is somebody different ordering than it is receiving, not always, but if that is the case, is there communication? Someone ordering a bunch of stuff, it gets brought in and no one even knows where to go with it. They don't know where it's supposed to go on the floor that other people are happy with. The production team now can't find it. Whatever that looks like. Um, we see sometimes when I walk into a brewery, it's really easy for me to talk to somebody and say, so when that sells out in that corner, when are we buying new stuff? Well, we buy it right away. Okay, well, what about the five bags that are sitting over here in this corner? And they didn't, right? They don't, they just don't even look at it, right? And I'm not trying to make them look foolish, but I think that's a big piece of understanding where those pieces are coming in with the procurement. Um, so same thing with, you know, expense policies, who's spending what and when and who has access to that. Um, company our size is the same thing. You know, certain ones have, certain people have credit cards when they travel, other people don't. Um, this was set up because someone traveled and spent a little too much money on a credit card, right? And now you have expense policies and different things that come into play as well. Need to think about that now when you're maybe a brewery of five or 10, as opposed to a brewery of 25 or 35 folks, and everyone has credit cards, and no one knows where that money came from, and now you have to employ an accountant to figure that out, right? Um, what does that look like, and is it ex it's, it's extremely important. Staff roles. Um, an the example up there, just a bookkeeper and a controller. Do you need a CFO, a bookkeeper, and a controller? And, you know, is that three roles? It's kind of doing not all the same things, but do you need someone that can maybe do all of them <laughs> and maybe eliminate some of those positions to put them into something else to really help with all of that? End of the month procedures. Um, this is again where I mentioned everybody needs to be brought in on the same level so everyone knows what's going on. You can't just have your sales team that's doing their own end of month checklist, your production team's doing something different, operations is doing something different. Gives us a chance to all come together, maybe throw some sort of get together. Um, we like to do beer Fridays. So every beer Friday we kind of get together and we talk about what's going on with the company. This is again just a, a stand up type thing uh, where we get to drink and have fun, but also hey, this is what's going on, checks and balances for everybody, doing really well here, we need to step it up here, whatever that looks like. Technology review, this is something just extremely important to maybe build out a metrics, um, and a, a matrix, and again, this might seem boring, but what does it look like when you're thinking about different financials, uh, different inventory management system, a POS, CRM? There's a lot for you guys to think about. There's a lot for you to think about in terms of integration. Does it all come together? Um, something and a couple questions that I would definitely ask um, if you're going to build a matrix to figure out what you need is cost, obviously, affordability on multiple pieces, because if you get one piece, you might have to employ another piece to make that all come together. Um, what does it look like for users? Do you have to pay per user? Are you paying? You get unlimited users, because again, if you have to pay for a user and you only have one person in it, then everyone's logging into one login and no one really has accountability for who's doing what within the system. It all looks like you're the person doing it and there's no accountability to come back to that. Um, what are the integrations that come with the software? Could be anything. Inventory management, financial system, task management. What, is the, what do the integrations look like? Are they actually worth it? Um, are they additional? What does that look like? Again, a piece you have to think of. And then contract length. If you sign up with a software, you sign up with a piece of, of integration that works with another piece of software and you're locked in for three years, but you hate it within the first three months, what are you doing now? Are you stuck being bought out of something? Or what does that look like? Again, something extremely important to think about a big piece that a lot of people kind of neglect is internal communication. I know a lot of people just text, and that's totally fine, or send screenshots, but is there something that you could really streamline internal communication? Because, again, as you grow and you have multiple locations, sometimes a text doesn't always get read, phone gets left somewhere, what happens? I mean, you've got to have better internal communication thoughts. Again, really quick, any questions? <laughs> 
A couple of good things that I want to roll over real quick. Main roles that we see. Okay, this is just a little additional piece. Um, main roles that we see you need to have in a brewery. As you're getting going, you're wondering what roles are important, what you need to do, uh, what you can't live without. Uh, we see financial. Obviously, you need to have a financial role, someone that's handling all that. We kind of combine production ops, so we see folks that kind of do the production piece and the operations piece. That can be combined um, if you've got the right person, obviously, and someone that understands those pieces. Um, and then a sales role. Maybe it's a sales and tap room at the beginning. Maybe it's a sales role then as things roll out. Um, but what does that look like continue to move forward? And then obviously, what I mentioned earlier, can't be the same person doing the checking on themselves. That's important. Set those checks and balances up within your own company. That someone's doing it, someone else is coming in to check it, whatever that may be. Employ it early because, again, if you get six months down the road and you wonder why the numbers were off, well, maybe that person was just like, oh, yeah, I checked it. and never really got checked. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Definitely, and we always we always have the opportunity to customize. So within certain inventory management systems, ours particularly, we are able to customize any of those. There's over 100 pre-populated reports. Again, if it's clunky for you, it doesn't work. That's what our team is for. Um, I always recommend also if you have a report that you really like to send it in. It's fair. Uh, ours are built off of pivot tables, just so you all. She's asking about reporting systems within ours. Um, and again, there's, there's maybe some clunky pieces. If pivot, trust me, pivot, pivot, Tables are not my love language by any means, so it's not something that I spend a lot of time moving things around, but... That's, that's fair. I was having a conversation earlier about some of that, um, and... Again, one of the reasons we're up here is to learn more and more from you. Um, ours is proprietary. We're happy to say, let's take that report. Let's look at what it looks like. Can we build reports to make that easier? Um, the pivot tables, again, is, is sometimes a, a bear for certain people, and I totally understand that. It's definitely that way for me. But we have some folks on support that they can understand that big time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It could be easier. That's fair. If you could stop, we have uh, at booth 22. So come by. Um, I don't know if Hannah went back to the thing. No, 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 you're totally fine. But Hannah, Hannah is kind of, uh, she'd be our report guru. Uh, but feel free. I know it's, again, for, for folks that's it's difficult. Uh, but, but come back to the booth. Hannah created most of those reports. So totally understand. And I don't take that as negative. I understand. No, you're fine. Any other questions? And again, my information should be up here behind me. Um, happy to help at any point. If you want to see a demo, if you want to be walked through some stuff, we can do that as well. Yes. Definitely. And if you heard what, what she mentioned, again, this is not, not a plug for us, Ecos. Um, but we, um, we did take a, a Series A investment. It got announced yesterday. So exciting for those of us in Canada, but they're all back in North Carolina celebrating, I'm sure. Um, but yes, the big piece being we're adding more staff members, adding more developers, adding more of that to, there's a lot to be worked on. We only have you know, two POS integrations right now. That will change drastically. There's a lot of you know, things that we're constantly changing with bugs and different, that happen all the time right, with software, and we understand that, but there'll be quicker fixes. There'll be more information that we can get back out to you, um, and there's a lot that we're working to add. We just added multiple user profiles, right? which before you had one user profile when you logged in, now you can have multiple, uh, which again, Smaller shops, we understand you're the wearer of all hats, and, and our system was a little clunky before, so we changed that. So there's a lot to come up. Um, and again, a lot of it will come because of the, the money that came in. Yeah, it's fine. It's 
It's a great question. So I actually help also manage uh, Eco Cider Maker and the Wine Maker, and then we created Ecos Maker earlier this year, which handles all food and beverage. So we sell the cold. We have systems set up for that to track it. It's different than obviously the brewing process. You can start from if cider, you can start from any tote or any tank, whatever that may be. You could do skincare if you wanted to in the system right now. But again, again, we're happy to talk more about that. I, I could show you a demo. We're sitting at the booth right now, so I'm happy to do that. Yes. So currently, I know when, when, when tasks are set and if something is there, they, they get notified within the system. And obviously, we have little notifications within that. But I know you're looking for additional pieces. That's a good thing to bring up. Uh, that's, that's, uh, if you want text messages sent out to folks, again, I think some of the thought being you're setting 50 tasks for me at night. Yeah, but no, I, I, that totally makes sense. We'll, um, I know we've got folks in the back writing this down as we speak. So that's an interesting piece. Just better notification up front. Yeah. Yeah, we can, because again, so with un there's unlimited users in the profile, they should be able to be notified. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good piece. Good feedback. Any other questions? Yes. Mm hmm. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, we can, we can, this just got released, so we'll definitely. Come, come by and we'll help you with that. Because <laughs> it was too clunky before. You had to log out of the system, log back in. Yeah, so we'll, we'll help you with that. Any, any other questions? Again, if you're interested and you've written down that information, we will follow up with a sample chart of accounts. We'll also follow up with that template. Um, you know, we, can, we can get you information. Come by the booth if you want more information. We're happy to help. Alex, stand in the back as well as the other sales guy. Um, so most of you that sign up with Ecos, Oh, you missed it. There you go. Most of you that signed up with us probably talked to Alec a while back because uh, he's been around for a while. So thank you guys for being here. Appreciate that. If you have more information, please come up afterwards.